All right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us today for another Security Studio webinar. I am super excited about the content that we have today and my guest, of course. Um, so we're going to be talking about 11 ways to make money with Security Studio. And, you know, obviously this really, really is, is something we're passionate about. Um, my name is Frank Gurney. I'm the channel director here at Security Studio. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. If you can hear my voice and see 11 ways to make money with Security Studio on the screen, if you could just hit that hand raise button you have at the bottom there, that's going to let me know that uh, you can hear us and see us okay. Okay, perfect. All right. Thanks, guys. Um, you also have a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen there. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, we will be answering questions live at the end. So feel free to use that tab to add your questions in and we'll get to those um, towards the end. Um, and so without further ado, I'd love to introduce uh, the CEO of both FR Secure and Security Studio, Evan Francine. Evan, great to see you, bud. Great to see you too, Frank. Thanks for Thanks for having me. This should be a good discussion. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, we want to get uh, we want to get into get right into this. Um, so let's let's move forward with our slides here. Um, so I, looked, Evan, I actually looked a lot better, I think, than <laughs> do some comparisons. Yeah, yeah, me too. You know, I, I like our look there, and those photos are pretty good. Of course, we always look better in black and white, right? I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Um, so yeah, so Evan, like, you know, one of the things that comes up a lot when we're, you know, talking to different folks and and getting out there is like, man, you know, I want to get started down this road of all these different types of services and things. And, you know, I'm just not sure where to start. You know, how do I make money? You know, how do I get going with this stuff? And I think we, we put together, you know, some really good um, information here to go through, mm -hmm. but um, man, how did you get started with all this stuff? Because I know, you know, you built FR from the ground up. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear a little bit about that story. Yeah. Well, and it's funny, I'm at a conference now and, you know, I'm in, I'm in the, a side room and, uh, you come, you come here and I see a bunch of people that I haven't seen in a long time. And there's common questions, I think, you know, over the years that I get, and this is one of them, uh, starting a business in general, you know, I think the biggest thing I see with a lot of people who don't, do well in starting businesses is they don't actually commit to it. Uh, there are going to be difficult times. There are going to be things that you, you're going to feel uncomfortable sometimes talking about things that you haven't talked about before. You're going to entertain questions that you haven't entertained before. And so I think one it, it is, is a commitment. The, in starting FR secure, the focus was and is today it has it never changed it's to fix the broken industry so choose a problem and, and that's where it started choose a problem and then fix it stay focused on the problem if you focus on the mission you'll make money if you focus on the money you won't make the mission you know and so that was the initial and, and where we started was we're going to be a service organization we're not going to sell products um so that way when we consult you you know for instance tell your firewall stinks it's because it stinks it's not because i'm trying to sell you one uh so it was very important for us to build this on consulting to build this on advice core to that was the, you know doing information security risk assessments information security is risk management i can't manage risk unless i assess it first unless i know it. it's just like diagnosing a car you know an auto mechanic can't uh, a good one anyway you know, wouldn't start fixing, you know, changing tires on your car when actually you have an engine knock, right? I mean, you need to do a diagnosis and that's where yeah. most things start. Uh, and, and the business just grew from there. I think the the things our customers, we hear consistently that they appreciate the most about us is that they trust us. They know that we are here to serve them. This is a service industry, believe it or not, not a product industry. Uh, and the same thing resonates, you know, in, in giving the talks, you know, we give a couple of talks here and it's crazy how still in this industry, there's so much confusion and you have such a great opportunity to serve your customers, take away the confusion, 
um, help them make good decisions and they'll be customers for life. You know, FR Secure, I mean, I've seen people here at this conference that they were a customer back in 2010, you know, and they're, hey, Evan, yeah. how you doing? And, you know, so it's, it's just a great opportunity, especially now in this current market environment. Uh, there's tons and tons of opportunity. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, we have a we have a ton of great content coming up, but I love this question line a little bit, just being able to sit down with you and kind of pick your brain a little bit, because, you know, we have a lot of different types of people on this webinar today. But, you know, we are we have been talking a lot to like MSPs and that channel. And one of the things that, you know, I know from being in that space is, you know, we get really excited. We go to these events like the cybersecurity show and different different things. And we see all these really cool tools and we might sign up to some like security studio. We take it back to our, you know, our team and we have, you know, then we, then we have to present it to the employees, right? And the, then we get the employee pushback and then we get, um, you know, like it ends up a lot of times, you know, stopping dead for a while. How do, mm -hmm. how do you get past that? And how do you like, you know, make things happen quicker, right? Because I, we know cybersecurity is super important right now. And it's something that everybody should embrace. But as a CEO, how do you, you know, get your team to move on something you believe in, but maybe they're not quite sold on? I think it, it's, it's being transparent. Uh, I mean, it's going to sound kind of corny, maybe. One, it's entertaining those objections. Yeah. There might be some legitimate objections there. It's these discussions that are, I think, sometimes difficult and uncomfortable that produce some of the best solutions. You know, I think a lot of times we're just too close minded. We don't think it all through. Uh, so depending, so that really leads to the the answer. It depends on what the objection is. Mm -hmm. If the objection is, I don't think we can make money at it. Well, why? Because right. you know, I know firsthand that. I mean, FR Secure this year, just in services, just in what they do, you know, approaching $30 million in revenue this year, uh, Security Studio. I mean, you've just seen it happen so many times that uh, depending on what that objection is, almost always you can overcome it. One of the things that people really need to understand about when you talk about risk management, a common mistake is to take make risk decisions without context. And so... It's like, it's obvious that we need endpoint solution, or it's obvious that we need training and awareness. And it's obvious we need all these things. MFA and all the other things. Yeah. Right. Well, right. help me prioritize it. Because as an executive and as you know, a consultant to many, many executives over the years, what they really want is one thing, the next thing. You know, there's never just one. And they're not stupid. They understand that there's many things, but give me the one thing right now. They want the solution, not the thing, right? Like they want yeah. the big picture. What's your package that covers all this stuff? How how do you take care of me? That right. sort of thing. I think that and that makes a lot of sense. Um, and the assessment yeah. then gives you that it gives you that one thing, and then it also gives puts it in context for you, right? And then gives you a roadmap that you can follow. And and I've always been open and honest. It doesn't the the tool really doesn't matter as much. It's how you, how you use it. A hammer is a hammer. Right. So rather than arguing whether your hammer is better than my hammer, it's probably the use of the hammer that's going to be the biggest issue. <laughs> Absolutely. And the one, the one thing that, you know, it, I'm, I'm finding more and more as we kind of go down this road for all different types of companies is the reality is, you know, risk assessment, risk management, all of this kind of stuff is not, just about compliance. It's not just about governance. It's about literally every business has a threat out there. It doesn't matter if you're the coffee shop on the down the road or you're the largest enterprise business. The threat really is the same because those cyber attackers, whoever's out there, they're not looking for the big fish per se. They're looking for any open opportunity they can get, right? Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. And when you... The same thing has been true for every compliance, you know, being in this industry since, you know, the early 90s, you know, prior to HIPAA in 96 and prior to FFIEC and or GLBA and God knows what else, it's the intent of every single compliance initiative, the intent has been risk management. 
But what people generally do when they don't understand something is they do what they've been told to do they, rather than what they should have, you know, they should do. So it comes down to the intent of the law versus the letter of the law. Now, one of those gives you str a strategic advantage to, to grow your business. The other one sort of constrains you because you're just doing what you've been told to do. That's a big difference between risk management and information security and compliance. If you manage risk well, you will be compliant. The other way doesn't work. Well, and that it's ever changing, right? I mean, all of these safeguards and, and different compliance requirements, they change every other day. There's a new one out. There's something always hitting you. So, you know, to take that approach first, and, you know, we say this a lot, like to go in and just check all the boxes, you're not doing the best security you possibly can. You're only meeting the need of one specific type of requirement. So going from an InfoSec mindset, which I love the way that, you know, you've kind of positioned the entire way of doing business over what we're seeing more and more in the industry is, well, here's a tool that allows you to check all the boxes and, you know, get in, get out. Right. right. But the reality is like, you know, as consultants, as folks who really care for their customers or their clients, you want to do the best security you possibly can. And, you know, that's just something that, that I love about our approach. So um, when having kids, it's like the difference between telling your kids telling your kids to clean the room and them them wanting to clean your clean the room. <laughs> yeah. There's a big difference between the quality and what happens with the room. Right? Now it's really rare to find a kid that wants to clean the room and it's also, you know, maybe a little rarer to find you know companies that want to manage risk, but at the end of the day it's the best way to do it. Yeah, and I I feel like it should just be a part of any managed service solution for any type of company, whether you're a cyber security consultant, an MSP or anything, mm -hmm. um, it should just be, just be the first thing you do, no matter what type of cyber engagement you, you, you have is right. you take them through that process. Right. And I think that's something FR does really well is, you know, make sure that every single client kind of goes through the same type of process. It also allows you to standardize get your guys trained up on the way to do things the right way, I think. So, yeah. And I um, wish there, you know, a lot of the people were here because you, and I'm not, I am biased. I'm not, you know, to say that I'm not about FR secure, but the number of people that come up to the booth and they just want to engage because you've built so much trust over the years. Uh, there's lots of vendors here. Uh, and our booth is just jam packed because they want to talk about these things they want good advice. They want to do the right thing. Um, so it makes a huge difference in the marketplace when you operate your business this way. And I think MSPs that do the same give them gives them a really uh, strong competitive advantage. Yeah, and uh, you know, I I commend you for allowing Security Studio to really kind of give the secret sauce of FR away because you know essentially that's that's fixing the broken industry, right? I mean, one step at a time, because if you've done something that's successful and you can essentially provide the folks that come on board as partners of Security Studio to, you know, see how it's been done, see how some how another company is being successful and provide them that training and information and say, here, look, take this and do it this way. And you can also be successful. And at the same time, we're meeting the mission, right? Of getting the best security out to every company out there that we can possibly touch, which I think. Well, is, and, it, and, it, and it was a huge advantage, you know, in hindsight, it was a huge advantage for FR secure to do that too, from just a business perspective, it certainly started as it's the right thing to do because it's mission. And it's, I mean, man, it, I couldn't be more living proof. I'm not money voted. If you see how I dress and how I behave, uh, but how much money you make when you put mission first, you know, it comes off it when you're serving your customers. And so the mission was the initial drive for that. But then on the business side of things, I think what kills so many businesses is comfort and resting on your laurels, right? If you, what makes a business, I think, especially in today's environment, uh, stronger is continually pushing them to innovate to do things differently, to do things better. So when we moved the, you know, the, into Security Studio, we split that piece off. 
it forced FR Secure to figure out ways to do things better with other things. And it made the company, you know, much stronger in the end. Yeah, that makes sense. All right. Well, let's let's jump into some of these 11 ways of making money. I think, um, you know, it's great to see all the things that, you know, Security Studio as a tool, which was built really as a risk management platform, um, all the ways that that you guys have, FR really has taken this and run with it. I, I know a lot of this is is based on, you know, things that they have um, done with the tool. And then on top of that, you know, some things that, that you've kind of thought like, Wow, these are ways to make money as well. So this first one, comprehensive security profile. Tell us a little about that, Evan. Yeah, so there's, when you talk about risk management, uh, it's almost like the language of business, I'm kind of, you know me, I squirrel a lot. So I might start here and I might end up over here, but then I'll come back and, and be over here again. The language of business uh, is accounting, it's money. And it was Warren Buffett who said that, right? And so when you think about speaking the language of business, because I hear it from IT people all the time. I hear it from information security people all the time. You got to speak the language of business. You got to speak the language of business. They don't speak the language of business, right? So on the accounting side of things, we have different financial statements that do different things, right? You've got a balance sheet. You've got a cash flow statement. You've got an income statement. The same sort of thing, if you take sort of the same sort of thing to information security, you've got an information security risk assessment. It's like an internal, this is how we do things with information security. These are the risks that are present in the way we do information security. Then you've got third-party information security risk, which would be just another aspect of information security risk for us to account for. And then you've got S2 uh, team, which is the hardest, I think, for some people to grasp. But once you grasp it, it's like, oh my God, yeah, that's really important too. It's the people part. Mm -hmm. And it's not the traditional, well, let's do quizzes, let's do phishing tests, let's do things like that. Instead, is what motivates people the most is what is protecting what matters to them most. And so how about at home? How do you do information security at home? I get that all the time when I give talks. It's, well, I'm not a security person. And I, I was about ready to swear, but I'm not. Uh, <laughs> you are a security person. You are absolutely, yeah. whether you're a good one or not, that's up to you because just like you have CEOs at businesses, there's a CEO at home, isn't there? Yeah. Isn't there somebody who decides and who's ultimately responsible for information security at home? Whether you configured your router correctly, changed default passwords, whether you should install this camera surveillance system or not, whether your kids are using computers appropriately or not. I mean, there's so many things there. And so we started with an S2, it's called S2Me, and it's free. Uh, the entire state of North Dakota, you know, adopted that. And it's funny because the CIO, the former CIO for the state of North Dakota is here, Sean Riley. We were hanging out before. That's why I was almost late for this call, by the way. It was his fault. <laughs> uh, so S2Me, how I do information security at home for your employees, how do they protect their families? People are creatures of habit. There's a translation between that and what they're doing at, at work. Now, the difference between the S2 me and the S2 team is S2 team is only an aggregation of scores and trends. You never get to see the exact results of people's security at home because it's for them, not you at work, right? So you count for all of this in, internal information, security risk management, third-party information, security risk management, and people. Combine them together and you have the comprehensive security profile, uh, which is very valuable. You know, I think there's very valuable insights into what I should do around information security risk management, you know, based on this profile. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I've, I've looked at the, I think that's an amazing way to start, right? It's, it's to get, you know, get in there and, and find out all of this information across each one of these pieces. And we put we put numbers in here, so like you you have twenty five hundred to seven thousand a month, um, mm -hmm. you know. And I know living and working in kind of the MSP space, that sounds unobtainable because you know in the MSP space you really have a lot of you know the S small business and the SMB. And one of the things I I you know as I go out and talk to more and more MSPs, you know, I let them know that that Security Studio really opens up the M to them in SMB. How how would you say that you 
get someone to believe that or believe they could they can charge these kind of numbers is there is there something that you you might be able to say like well we've done it so we know that but you know beyond that how how do you get someone to actually believe that this is kind of real well and and you know anybody who knows me know knows I'm really transparent in truth this one for somebody who hasn't done security stuff or doesn't um, it is working on the smaller part of the business or, you know, the small business market. This one might be the hardest one to start with. You can work them into it, right? So there's three things you always need to have uh, to get a new customer. Trust, credibility, and likability. So trust, do I trust you have my best interest at heart? Those things, credible, can you actually do what you say you can do? And then, you know, you're not a jerk while you do it. Mm -hmm. now, that's the best way to get a customer. Now, where we start our journey together as customer and provider, uh, it varies. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've got a really strong relationship and you've established, you know, things in other parts, you know, the, the CSP is a place where you can go, but uh, it's a journey, right? Now, in terms of the, the cost and price, uh, we never charge anything that's not justified. Right. So if if it becomes a cost issue, then it becomes more of a budget issue. Right. One of the things we've never really done well as an industry is justify budget for information security spend. Security Studio does a great we can security studio and the platform is a great tool to, to do that for you, but it's not out of the gate sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you get pushed back on the twenty five hundred to seven thousand dollars a month for a comprehensive security profile, it's in honesty in small businesses, it's probably more than they it's probably biting off more than they can chew anyway, not just from a budget perspective, but also from a security perspective. So in most cases, in Security Studio or FR Secure would testify to the same. In most cases, you start with an S2 org mm -hmm. or a CVC so engagement. And then as you start getting one part of information security kind of standing on its own. It's more expensive to build it than it is to maintain it. Once you get to that maintaining mode, then it's time often to expand into other parts of information security, maybe with S2 vendor. Mm -hmm. uh, but eventually, you know, this is uh, where you end up. Yeah. And, and, and I'll mention too, that, you know, these 11 ways are, are additional ways that you can, you know, make money um, using the tool and so just as Evan was saying, you know, starting with with an S2 org, that's what we obviously teach everyone initially to do is just everything starts with a risk assessment in cy any cyber engagement, because how else do you know what to put in an environment, right? No different than a network assessment on, you know, a managed engagement of IT services or any of that stuff. We start with a risk assessment and get a really good understanding. And then, of course, with our S2 score, a really easy way to explain uh, to a customer where they stand and where they can go, right? But um, yeah, so so number two here, we have four phase information security assessments. So so what is this, Evan? So this is, you know, the, the previous one was a monthly recurring revenue thing. It's a service that continues to run. This is a project-based uh, method to use the platform to make money. Um, an information security risk assessment is just that. What are my most significant information security risks so that I can make sense of them, put them into context, make good decisions from here, right? So this is usually a starting point, not an ending point, right? Do this and then where do we go? Uh, this is a, usually a good introductory type of engagement with most customers. So maybe a first time we've done anything together, we're going to do an assessment. We're going to present that assessment. And we're going to use this as an opportunity to get to know each other, how we do business, how, what, what makes sense with security, what doesn't make sense with security. Anybody who's done assessments with this platform, it's a great opportunity while you're doing the assessment to do a whole bunch of consulting, a whole bunch of back and forth and asking questions and, you know, all that good stuff. So this is usually a starting point. The four phases, when we talk about four phases, for those who aren't familiar with the platform, uh, we break information security into four phases. The first phase is administrative controls. That's the people part of security, uh, policy, governance, HR stuff, things like that. The second phase is physical security. 
And we have a saying on the first phase, uh, it doesn't really matter how strong your firewall is when uh, somebody can just steal your password or somebody just call and get your password, right? So you can have all the great technology ever uh, and still very easily bypass those controls. And that is the most common way to bypass controls is to just ask you for your password. Why, why spend <laughs> Why spend hours and hours trying to hack your firewall? Right, right. Ask MGM, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, we see it all the time. I mean, that's one of the cool things about about being a consultant is you get to see all the different things that are sort of happening without being in the weeds, you know, um, which, you know, is another advantage to being a consultant. Uh, physical controls, doesn't matter how good your firewall is when I can come steal your server. So physical controls, we have to account for that one way or another. And then phase three and four are internal and external technical controls. That's where we get into the IT parts of information security. Uh, so those are the four phases when we talk about a four-phase assessment. It's the most comprehensive uh, information security risk assessment that, that you can do with the platform. All right, amazing. Yeah, let's move to number three. So administrative security assessment. So we just kind of talked about that, but let's break that down a little further. So you can actually separate these as individual assessments or potential opportunities if someone maybe doesn't need all the others or what's the thought here? Again, it, it you know, you always have to meet the customer where they're at. You mm -hmm. know, I think a lot of times we don't do a good job at that in our industry. We overwhelm them. So sometimes let's just start here. Let's just do administrative controls. Let's talk about that. Let's focus on that. And when we get to the others, we'll get to the others. Uh, sometimes an organization is large enough to where we're going to spend the next year just here. Mm -hmm. right? We've got maybe facilities, a facilities department that does the the technical or the physical stuff and IT does their own assessments, you know? So sometimes you break it up that way. Um, it's always, I think administrative controls is also a good kind of introduct, introductory type assessment. Sometimes a phase four a four phase assessment, even that's overwhelming for people. So back it down, you know, meet them where they're at. So that's right. often what administrative controls are used for. All right. Very good. All right. Physical, down the physical line, assessments right? are awesome because yeah. lots of organizations like take a school district, for instance, or the state of Minnesota where I'm at now, they've got tons of physical locations. They've got IT who does, you know, parts and bits over here and they've got their policies and governance comes from, uh, maybe minute, right? The agency that oversees that. So this allows you the flexibility to incorporate all these physical locations, put them into context with everything else. So, uh, and sometimes, like I said, facilities people, they don't care about the IT stuff. I just want to do the physical assessments. So a lot of times that's, you know, what you can do. Well, it makes sense too. And, and the way that you're kind of breaking this down, like you said, meet them where they're at, right? Sometimes, you know, we we talk a lot about the the complete assessment, everything. Um, so I can see how this this could be beneficial for some, like maybe you're just coming in and starting with the physical security and maybe you're talking about additional projects in the future where you do, you know, the administrative or some of the IT sections, or maybe they have the IT stuff completely handled, but they've never thought about administrative or physical side of things. So yeah, this is a really nice approach to that. Well, um, and we always have this, like getting the customer is not the objective, right? I mean, obviously you need to get that before right. you can go on to the other stuff. The objective is the relationship with the customer, right? So continuing, continuing to keep them engaged over a long period of time for their benefit, mm -hmm. right? So if we start here, well, then what next? Well, this is what's next and this is what's next. And so it allows me as your consultant to give you expectations of what we're going to do over the next 10, however long we end up working together, but also doing it on a platform where there are other partners. Yeah. So let's, let's say I win the lottery, right? We say that now instead of getting hit by a bus and I'm not available anymore. Well, we can continue the progress with another partner, you know? So there's just lots of different ways you can use this. Well, I think taking the phase approach as well, you you really kind of minimize the burden on the business. So that's another right. another thing because it can be very overwhelming and burdensome to, you know, take someone through a level three assessment, right? And so, you know, if 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 that's something that you're having to do to break it up into these kind of chunks, 
it can really make it a lot less uh, less of a burden for a business to to go through that and you know, or overwhelming, that, right? Sometimes yeah. you're just like, oh my god, really? There's more, right? Sure, there is, but uh, and and also, you know, you needed we needed to build a platform that would scale down to the small to mid sized business. Uh, so, you know, the smallest assessments I've done over the years is probably five, maybe a five employee bank. So, and that would be obviously a phase one, maybe just starting with administrative controls and kind of moving through, but it's also scaled as large as, you know, the state of Minnesota, where we've got 92 different government agencies, 87 counties, 820, uh, you know, municipalities. And I mean, it's very complex. So having these segments and be able to put it together this way gives us the flexibility to account for something as complex as that. So it goes both ways, mm -hmm. which I think is great. As you start in this area, tackling something like the state of Minnesota may not be the place where you want to start, right? but it gives you a place to grow into. And our, our market, the total addressable market right now I would estimate we're we're saturating maybe 15%. 15% of the market, the total addressable market is actually doing information security risk assessments and managing security the only way you can. Mm -hmm. and you can argue about it. You know, it's funny because we argue so much in our industry too. This is risk management, period. It is. It always will be. It's not going to change. So there is only one way to manage information security. That's through risk management. So the so 15% of the total addressable market. So rather than me fighting you, over the 15% are already doing it. Why don't we work together and go get the 85? Right. And that's the point with you know building a platform like this is and building a partner community. So that let's go get it. It's yeah. sitting. Well, I think the other thing about this, the phase approach too of this is. You know, we're showing it here as project work, but the reality is like as a managed service, if you take it as a phase approach and mm -hmm. say over, you know, we're going to, we're going to have this as a monthly recurring managed service, but in the, our first phase, we're going to take you through this piece that right. could be, you know, the, over the next three months. And then over the next three months from there, you might take them to the next phase. And maybe all of this is in a level one, right? And then for the next year, you know, we're going to take you up to the next level, you know, to get you in a better security position. Right. So it really does work well, even in this kind of phase scenario um, as a managed service, because you could essentially take them through these phases over time rather than trying to get it all done in, you know, like a very short amount of time, which can be very, very over overwhelming, as you said. And cost is always an issue too, right? So, you know, maybe... I can't afford to do all of it, but I know I need to do something. Right. And and the the reality with risk management and when you talk about negligence, you know, having been in enough legal cases over the years too, progress is always defensible. What's not defensible is ignorance or status quo or getting you know worse. So if you if you have an organization that's never done a risk assessment before or never done it, you know, maybe the right way or something, whatever. If you just do an administrative controls assessment, and that's all you do this year. That's progress, right? And done something and defense right. to that. Yeah. And next year we're going to bite off, you know, our internal technical controls. Again, that's progress, but it also leads to this long term relationship. That I think it's, it's invaluable, right? How we've grown an entire business. Yeah. So here is a still internal and external. We talked a little bit about that, so we probably can move on from here. Um, so VC, so man, this is you know one of the big big things out there, right? It is. It uh, <laughs> and going back to the original mission, you know, for all of this, it find a you just fix a problem, right? And so the problem here was so many organizations uh, selling fractional or VC so services to customers that was actually I, it was hard to believe that there were people were paying for it. To be honest. Uh, and so it's defining what is a VC so, and then how do we empower them, enable them to serve their customers well, and at the same time, you know, make it a market differentiator. So, if you're a, v a CVC so and I'm not, will the customer value one more than the other, right? And choose you over them, uh, ideally, and, that, and, that, and that's proven out to be true. 
Now the VCSO service or this training offering our partners, I think many of the partners, you know, it's part of their partner package, you know, to get trained because we, we want to empower you to do well. Uh, but then there's this other piece, like I can, um, I can potentially, you know, uh, refer somebody to be a DC. So like, why would I ever ask somebody ask for more competition? And the logic here is there's more value. The more CVC SOs there are, the more value there is in CVC SOs, right? And that's coming up later. But here with the VC SO practice, FR Secure this year, uh, man, I don't know what the number is, but it's a few hundred, you know, active VC SO clients. Uh, probably in just this service alone, 16 to 20 million in revenue this year. We have we've had a lot of practice with this, uh, lots of experience. And we just took all of that and put that into the into how you do this typical price, the $20,000 a month. That was the last one that I did personally uh, while I was still a practitioner in, in VC. So that was a global travel company, uh, but it gives you kind of the high end of what this service can bring. The margins are awesome. One of the biggest challenges I think for customers or for partners in selling the practice is explaining it, how it works. Uh, it's a, different way of doing things um, and probably how many customers can I handle with one resource on average uh, once things are pretty well up and, and running for you one VC so can handle usually somewhere between 10 to 12 VC so customers at any given time simultaneously so we help you build that you know, the monthly recurring revenue is awesome. I think the customer engagement is great. The value they're getting is great. Uh, the VC shows themselves, they're ultra, ultra passionate about this work when they, when they start doing it. Yeah. So it's a lot of yeah. fun. And, and that's amazing stat, Evan, for you to give us that, that 10 to 12. I mean, it really gives you a good idea of if you're doing a full VC so engagement for a customer, you know, figure that you know, if you have a VC so on staff, that's pretty much what they can handle. And I think, you know, that's one of those things that people wonder, right, but don't necessarily have that information. So to, to get that from you is, is excellent. We really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so whole information security empowerment wise, man, I, I read your wise document. That's a, a really yeah. awesome piece of work there. So yeah, this is, uh, if this is your, your thing, um, and that's a th that's why we built the platform the way we built it too. It's built to be a utility tool, right? It's not built to be super sexy with all the bells and whistles and do one thing for everything kind of thing. It's a utility tool that I can use for a lot of different practices, a lot of different applications. The whole of state, and that one's been the state of Minnesota's here, North Dakota's here, Michigan this morning. I mean, it's they're all trying to solve this, right? So the market is hungry for how do I do whole of anything, whole of state, whole of an enterprise. And the truth of the way you do it is you take the complex thing and you break it down into its less complex components and then tackle it that way, right? And so wise is that um, it's where you make the most money is in the, the size and the complexity of the entity that you're tackling. So if you take like, you know, I mentioned how complex the state of Minnesota is um, as we're progressing more and more down this path it's uh it's a big collaborative effort lots of different places you can plug into that um yeah and it's 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 a ton of money but it's also a lot of work if you're <laughs> new, if you're new to information security or new to this for your business um there i would say this isn't a place for you to lead it, probably it's a place for you to plug in so if you'd work in like uh, SLED, we'd love to talk to you more about that so that we can help you. We can lead it and you can participate in it. You know, SLED being K-12, state and local government, uh, you know, all that stuff. But it's uh, it's really fun to do. But I mean, it's 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 hard. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. You, you're not going to start here probably. Right, right. Yeah, you'd all, you'd already have uh, maybe that as, a, as your niche or, or your vertical that you kind of 
work with the the different uh, organ types of organizations. And yeah, it's it's not somewhere you're going to start, but man, you sure could end up here um, over time. Well, and look um, for part people people that you can partner with to be here, right? right. So if if state state and local government is a place where you want to operate or you do other things, we want to talk to you because we're making those connections. I was here with the state of Minnesota and I was talking to the whole group of state of Minnesota people and the CISA guy, I don't know if you know CISA, um, for the state of Minnesota was walking by and his name is Chris. I'm like, hey, Chris. It's like, hey, Evan, what's up? You know, come over. Have you met, you know, so-and-so and so-and-so with the state of Minnesota people? It's like, no. And I'm like, really weird, man, because this is the state of Minnesota here and you're the CISA, the federal coordinator for the state of Minnesota. It, you, right. guys should probably, you guys should probably meet. Yeah, you guys should talk. <laughs> yeah. So the fact that uh, if you if your heart is there or you want to get into this whole of information security empowerment in state and local government or K-12, uh, we want to talk to you because we want to start connecting those together more. Mm -hmm. And if we have to lead it, we'll lead it. And then you can just kick some butt and make a whole bunch of money in the back end. That's fine with me. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. So third-party information security risk management as a service. That is a long acronym there, isn't it? <laughs> all right. So this is uh, where you, you know, or all organizations need to do third-party information security risk management. Uh, many of them aren't. Compliance is really pushing you more towards it, uh, which it should have from the get-go, honestly. Uh, but people don't want to do it, I think, sometimes, or they don't know how to do it. Uh, the way they're doing it might be cumbersome. It's a, And really, when you look at it from their perspective, if I'm an organization who doesn't do a lot really with information security, it sort of seems hypocritical for me to ask a third party how they're doing their information security. And that might be true if we were peers, but the fact of the matter is, is that you are their customer. So you can ask them whatever you want to ask them. But to take all the complexity and uncomfortable and whatever away from that we have a number of partners who do this for you right so we'll do vendor risk management sometimes they sh you shorten it to vendor risk management um we'll do that for you and fr secure others you know half dozen other partners you know have made really good really good niche here yeah it, it's definitely a big opportunity and you know i, I mean you probably could speak to that third-party um, breaches is a big issue, right? And and uh, you know, people that are connected to you in certain ways can a lot of times lead themselves into your business and your customer information and all that other stuff. So um, it's definitely an important piece, I think. Yeah, more than half of all breaches come directly or indirectly through third-party relationships. That speaks to the importance of this and. Uh, Security Studio does have the vendor risk management module, which is really easy to use and send out risk assessments to vendors. So that's one part that's really cool. So, all right. Um, yes. Yeah, yes. CVC so partnership. A little bit. Yeah. I think it's because I saw the CVC so badges there and I was like, oh, yeah. But then, <laughs> so the other one was VC so as a service. So, as, and this is huge because this market is going to explode. It already is. But the, um, the VC, so the previous one, the reason why is lots of CISOs are retiring, lots of CISOs, uh, but there's more demand for them than ever, right? So the ability for one CISO, one security resource to, you know, address multiple companies at the fraction of the cost is certainly an advantage. This, the other part of it is certifying VC so that they can do it gives them confidence. It gets them engaged with a community of other VCSOs um, so that they can collaborate, give, you know, support each other. This has really been exciting and it's grown quite a bit. Uh, this, the way you could make money as a partner is you could refer more people into that program. We've always had a referral program for people coming into the CVCSO. The biggest pushback and probably the one that might make you feel uncomfortable is why would I ever refer somebody to be a competitor to me. And I kind of hit on that a little bit. Um, you may not choose to, that's fine. It's just another way that you can make money, you know, with us and with the platform. Yeah. 
Well, and and there's there's plenty of opportunity out there, right? I mean, that's the other thing that it's it's easy to just to think that way, but at the same time, when you look at you know other companies, you know, in your space, you know, we have peers for a reason, and we can share information across our peers for a reason because there is so much business that we we generally don't cross paths too much, and if you do, it's very rare, right? Most of the time. So, yeah, that was um, one of the initial objections with FR Secure. They're like. We're gonna lose all our customers. Like, really? You're not. <laughs> right. uh, and it's okay to lose in this market. Being as wild as it is right now, it's it's okay once in a while to lose yeah. to a competitor. Yeah, for uh, sure, for sure. As long as the competitors doing them well. Right, of course. And we do have the, an amazing uh, CVC So Academy, guys. That you know, if you're not a partner today, or if that's something that you're looking at a partnership. One of the things that we really want to do is make sure that we have folks that are trained and know how to do this. They're standardized across the board of how to do these types of services and really help to create a community of, of folks that are, are like-minded and doing it you know, in similar fashions. And when you standardize in that way, um, you do fix a broken industry. And that's one of the major missions that we have as a company is to fix a broken industry. And standardization in itself is a way to really fix that. Absolutely. All right. So number 11. So you, you mentioned S to me early a little bit. And uh, so I'd love to hear a little more about team and me and how you, how you yeah. see that uh, being a good opportunity for folks. Well, pe people are creatures of habit and ultimately the things they do at home has a big influence on what they're doing in the business. We have numbers, a number of organizations that use S to me as an employee benefit. You know, it did, just we, we care about you enough, you know, as our employees that we want you to protect yourself at home. Others, you know, we've exploded so much into how we do business, you know, telecommuting and all of that and what have you. So there's always this interest from the business on how are they actually protecting data and the work they do for the business from home, right? So there's this mutual sort of and reliance on each other for doing the right things. Now, S2 Me is free. It's always free. It'll, you can go there right now. You know, HTTPS colon slash slash S2Me.io. You can register your own account. It's free. Nobody's going to market to you. It's it's yours. And you do your own risk assessment for you, your family, um, and have you know recommendations and what have you. So taking that that piece and then aggregating the data so that in, we can support you as a, as a as a, an employee or I'm sorry as an employer make sure that we're training you on the right things giving you the right advice so for instance if you saw that your entire pop you know, most of your population at home doesn't use a password manager well great what a great opportunity for us as an as an organization to buy password managers for all of you you know at home it's just a simple example so S2 Me is just the aggregation of the scores and the trends and what have you from the S2 Me's that your employees took. And um, yeah, that's what it is. And it's it's pretty awesome when people do it. Yeah, I think it can also lead into additional opportunities, right? Because if you see that there are issues with with the answers that you're getting from your employees, it, it gives you the opportunity to potentially integrate a you know, a security awareness training program, something of that nature that, you know, you can really start to help them in those ways. Because just as third party vendors have been a, a huge issue in, you know, breaches, so have employees, right? So employees have, are the ones who are clicking on things and potentially, you know, getting us uh, caught up in ransomware and that sort of stuff. So, um, you know, it's definitely important to, um, to be able to see that and understand it and know you know, where your employees stand from that risk standpoint. Well, very good. Well, you know, I know uh, we're, we're coming towards the end here, guys, and uh, we have that Q&A tab. So I'd love to get some questions up that Evan can answer here for you. Um, so let's see what we have a couple of questions in there now, Evan. Let's let's see what we've got. So one of the questions that came in early was um, comp about competition. So what techniques do you use to overcome competition from those simple scans that 
you know, different tech company or, you know, these different technologies and others are calling risk assessments. Um, obviously, there's no comparison to sitting down and doing a, a true risk assessment, but uh, they'd love to hear how we address that that issue of these scans that it's one of the things I'm hearing a lot about too is misinformation, right? People are calling things, things like calling something a pen test. It really isn't that or calling something a risk assessment. And it just really isn't that it's a, some kind of automated scan with AI or something. How do you, yeah. how do you address that Evan or how does FR address that? Yes. Yeah, so we've always had that issue, you know, in the industry, just some of it's intentional for sure, you know, to, misdirect somebody say something is something when it's not actually something sometimes it's unintentional you know so we try to look at it from both directions i think oftentimes it's giving them examples showing them the difference this is part of the education piece that comes with being a consultant right uh you say that this is a risk assessment yeah maybe for parts of information security but this is truly what it looks like right this is what and so you need to take that and we need to expand it into this, right? At some point, either now or later. And you use examples like, you know, if you're doing just a simple scan on how that doesn't really reflect on, say, administrative controls, for instance, where you do most of the consulting in an assessment, uh, there are obvious, you know, comparisons and differences between the two. Because a lot of times we'll find that customers are asking for some things that things that they don't know if they're asking for. Do you know what I mean? Right. I've had uh, e even very experienced CISOs say they they want a, a, a cybersecurity assessment, right? And just to clear the air, when you say cyber, are you talking about the technology parts of information security, or are you talking about all parts? So just having the discussion so that there's clarity between what you're asking for and what I'm going to provide to you, right? So having those discussions, um, you know, goes a long way. It's never going to, it's never going to uh, discount the importance of trust, credibility, and likability, right? Um, you always, you always have to establish that with a client anyway. So hopefully that answered the yeah. question. Yeah, and it's it's a hard thing, right? I mean, it's a hard thing when maybe somebody else is coming out and saying, hey, I can do this thing for you. It'll take minutes and be done and I'll spit you out something. Um, when the reality is, you know, you you have to deep dive deeper. And I think that is in the explanation of the VC so or the person that's sitting in front of the, the potential customer is letting them know what that difference is, right? I mean, it's, I, a simple example for me uh, that I always bring up is, you know, a scan can tell me there's a backup on the network, but does it tell me how often it backs up? Does it tell me when was the last time it was tested, right? Things like that. And no, the only questions are going to answer that. And, and taking someone through a set of questions, asking them about how they actually utilize their backup is going to tell them that, right? So. Yeah. yeah. And I used to analogy, you know, yesterday, you know, we, security people talk to a lot of security people and use the examples of like, um, I would never give somebody a saw to drive a nail, right? They're two different tools. Right. And sometimes, you know, I think uh, sometimes we don't know the difference between the tools and that's okay. That's part of the education piece, right? Yeah. I would use a hammer to draw, drive a, a nail. I would use a saw to cut a saw. And it gets even more dangerous when I give a toddler a saw. <laughs> yeah, of course. Which is sadly what we do when we don't explain well what it is we're trying to do. Right, right. It exactly. becomes really dangerous. If I rely on this scan to be my risk assessment when it's not, you know, that's a false sense of security. And that's a really dangerous place for you to be. Yeah, for sure. All right. We've had a few more questions and I know we're coming close to the top of the hour. I'm not sure if you have a, a cutoff, Evan, or not, but um, I know. Uh, I know the time is man you know me <laughs> yeah well you know <laughs> all right so we have a question from eric who asks how are your outputs received by paid external auditors and regulators within regulated industries as an example financial services banks and credit unions yeah that's a great question so when you say paid external auditors you know when you talk banks right the FDIC is paid, the OCC is paid. So you've got the governmental regulators and auditors, and you've got, you know, um, 
I don't know, a big accounting firm, you know, that also does their own audits and what have you. So in general, it's always stood up to regulatory scrutiny. So we've used, you know, many people uh, have used as our assessments for even as far as going uh, with your corrective action plans from HIPAA. Right. So HIPAA, if you know how that process works, HIPAA doesn't do audits, they do investigations. So a breach occurs. Eventually, OCR comes knocking. OCR is the Office for Civil Rights. They do their investigation. They find out, blah, 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 blah. Always in that corrective action plan, there is more comprehensive or whatever risk assessments, as well as usually a fine and maybe some other things. In many, in numerous cases, it has stood up for those corrective action plans. It's been fantastic for that. On the banking side of things, it's always stood up to FDIC and OCC audits uh, or regulators. Um, on the other side, it depends on the relationship, but it's all in general, it's been very well received from you know big accounting firms. Depends. Sometimes big accounting firms want to sell more services. So, you know, it's easy to try to poke and prod things. So hopefully that answered yeah. the question. From a regulatory perspective, totally defensible, always has been. Yeah. Well, and and I think, you know, the nice thing is we can give them, you know, their own access to the tool and that the auditor access to the tool to be able to go in and see anything that they want to see, see who everything is time time stamped, all the attachments, notes, everything are there. So it really gives them the ability to go in and look at that. Obviously, you can give them the the full report as well and just print them out 300 plus pages if you'd like. But, uh, I'm sure they'd rather uh, jump into the tool. It's always, and that's why it's always stood to scrutiny. I think if for most regulators, actually, they've been impressed when they've seen it. They're like, oh, that's a pretty damn good report. So it usually, and that's always a good foot to get on, you know, to, to take the first step with a, in an audit. It's like, oh, that we were impressed with that, you know. Yeah, for sure. All right, guys, I know we're coming to the top of the hour. We have a few more questions in here. I don't mind staying if Evan has time. So um, hmm. let's see. The next question we had, are there particular services among the 11 that have seen increased demand due to changing compliance requirements? And how do you, uh, Security Studio, foresee staying adaptable to these shifts in the future? Yeah, so to the two services top of mind that have seen the most demand increase would be VCSO uh, and third-party information security risk management. I think those are both uh, very high demand. You can build an entire business, like very, very lucrative, strong business, just doing VCSO services. Um, on the second part of that question, how do we stay? We let we we, we listen honestly. Uh, you come to things like this, like this event, and you talk to people. You listen a lot to what they're saying. What you know, the struggles that they're having, and then you think of solutions. You know, to those those struggles. Uh, same with our partners. Um, it's funny, I gave a the keynote yesterday and it was, this conference is about resilience. And it was, see, it was 16 days ago, we had a hurricane Lydia hit our house, right? It's a category four. And so the, on the resilience piece, the one thing that, that I learned, the biggest lesson, that was what the keynote was about, was about the lessons learned from that event the biggest thing I took away from that was the importance of situational awareness. And the same thing applies to this question. The way it applies to this question is paying attention, paying attention to what the regulators are saying, paying attention to what your customers are saying, paying attention to what your customers' customers are saying. That's how we we stay kind of where we're at and, and plan to go more in the future. We have a ton of work to do. Uh, you're never done. Yeah, that, that's a that's a true statement right there. You're never done. It's always evolving, right? So, um, all right. The next question we had was, uh, and this came from Glenn. So just to clarify, S2 team is the aggregate of employees doing the S2 me, question mark. Meaning the employees do the S2 me and see their individual scores in the four domains and can see the list of what they can do to improve that score, question. And the company sees all their employees' scores rolled together, but cannot see individual scores, their issues. So uh, yep. all question marks. So, Yeah, that's all correct. Yep. You know, your first uh, question, the clarification, that is true. 
the second uh there's actually the only, that is also all true except for it's not 10 domains it's it's 10 smaller domains uh so a little bit different structure to the s2me than to the traditional s2 org and then the last is also true and the reason why that's really important we need to protect the privacy of the employees you know there's a fine line between asking them what they're doing at home and knowing what they do at home so we have to protect that privacy and the, and another thing we know about employees is they will tell us what they want us to know what they want us what they think they want us to hear versus what it actually is right yeah. stole all the value from doing the exercise to begin with yeah and if you're doing it from within um security studio it's actually a module and you would be sending those essentially s 2 mes out from that. So you manage the entire process from there. You can send it as groups or teams or departments, that sort of thing. It's also going to score it in an S2 score, which can then aggregate to a singular score over across the three modules. So our organizational risk assessment, vendor risk management for an organization, as well as their employee risk, and bring those all together to be a single, singular number, um, which is really nice because you can also break all of that down further to then look at what needs to be worked on in the environment. Um, what's most impactful, what's the next thing you should be doing, all of those things. So yep. uh, cool. we had a question come in from Letson. So would you recommend getting an ISC2 CGRC cert or work the other classes to get to L3 or expert with Security Studios CVC? So First off, I want to point out how much I appreciate the question because just to ask that question from somebody who is obviously has has a bias, uh, it's awesome because it shows that you trust me enough to ask the question. Maybe unless you're trying, you know, whatever. I, I appreciate that. I think it depends on what you're going to use it for. Uh, there's pros and cons to each. Now, the the our assessment, I mean, our certification is it's first to market right? There isn't one like it. So it's not well known, right? So the value you get from our certification is going to be different than what you get from an ISC squared certification. ISC squared is very well known, right? The CISSP certification, you know, they call the gold standard in our industry. So it's not a question, you know, so I, I like the question because I would go for the ISC squared if I was looking for more maybe buy-in from an employer. I don't think your customers are going to care too much about that certification because they don't know the difference between the two anyway. So I think the audience of where you're going to use that certification, I think um, I think from the ISC squared, you'll learn more foundational um, theory kind of stuff, you know, theoretical sort of stuff, less practical stuff maybe which is important right i if you had time and money for both i would do both to be honest because isc squared does that whereas ours would be much more practical applying it now right so when we talk about level three the next class after it, which i'm the guy that needs to get his butt together and get it done but whatever the l3 uh the first one is you know securing complex environments whereas IC squared, I don't think is going to do a very good job at that because it's not very, it takes a lot of practical experience in order to secure a complex environment. So that's what we're taking and bringing to the table. The next class would be communications. You'll see it in IC squared, but it won't be focused like this class would. And then the third being budget. I've never seen IC squared do a good job at doing anything budgetary. Uh, so it just depends on the the application of the purpose. I think they're both great. Mine's better, yeah, but yeah, it's me. There you go. <laughs> I love it. Um, so Murad put up a something in the chat, which everyone might want to take a take a look at. I, I think it actually went to just host some panels, but um, he said we're not required to answer this. But he came across the LinkedIn post stating VCSOs are not useful. And here's all the reasons why, which made him smile. So <laughs> there's a list of about nine here. So uh, which which is super cool because that's what the CVC was built for. It tackles right. <laughs> freaking one of those. And so it's like, amen, that somebody called it out that your traditional CVC, you hold on, your traditional I'm Oscars here. I'm going to uh, <laughs> The traditional VCSO 
that that's a problem in our industry. What is yeah. a VC? So what did they do? And uh, there's a whole story behind that that I'll tell some other time. But uh, I totally agree with that. And that's why we have to solve those problems. All right. Well, guys, thanks so much for staying over with us and answering some qu or us getting some questions answered. I want to thank Evan Francine, uh, CEO of FR Secure and Security Studio for stopping by and answering these questions for us. If anybody's on this call that would like some more information on Security Studio or would like to talk to us or check out the platform, you can just go to securitystudio.com slash demo. Just sign up there. We'll, uh, we'd love to talk to you more about it. Uh, if you would like to just reach out, you have general questions or anything, feel free to, free to reach out to me. It's just F Gurney. So F as in Frank, G-U-R-N-E-E -E at securitystudio.com. Feel free to shoot me an email and we can talk. Uh, thank you everybody so much for the webinar. Yes, Evan, go ahead. I said, thank you, Frank. Great job. Thank you, Sarah and the marketing team for putting together this webinar. Look forward to doing more and I'll talk less, I promise, next time. Thanks, guys. Have a great day. Take care. Bye now.